In this lecture, we're going to talk about life insurance. How much do you need? What type of policy you should get? And what its role is in a household's financial plan? Do I need life insurance? People make pretty poor choices when it comes to life insurance, generally speaking. And the biggest problem that they have starts right at the beginning. They don't understand why they need life insurance, what it's for. They understand what it does. If you die, life insurance pays. That's what it does, but is that what it's for? They feel like the more likely I am to die, the more life insurance I need. There's maybe some element of truth to that, but that's really not what drives our decision of whether or not we need to buy life insurance. The question you need to ask yourself is, is if you died tomorrow, would anyone suffer financially? Who are the people who depend on your paycheck to get by? If somebody would suffer from that, say for example, your children, a surviving spouse, maybe elderly parents you're taking care of, if the answer is yes, then you need life insurance. If the answer is no, then you don't. Because life insurance isn't for the person who died, right? You die, you don't really care about money anymore. You're a ghost and you're not doing whatever ghosts do. But money, not really that important. What it's for is for the people you leave behind. Let's say you die at about age 40, where this black arrow is. When that happens, the financial capital you've able to acquire is capped at this green line. And so your family is expecting to get that entire blue curve, all of that money they're expecting to be able to use because they expect you to live and be able to continue to work. But when you die early, the amount of money they have to rely on shrinks dramatically. So instead of that big blue curve, they only have that little green line. That's all the money they have. And that's not enough to sustain the lifestyle they were planning on, they were expecting. So life insurance fills that gap. Okay, fills in the difference between how much your family needs if you were to die versus how much they'll actually have. And so there are a few ways to meet this need. Government benefits exist. Social Security survivors benefits can kick in and, and help, but they tend to be not as generous as most people need or want. You can use existing assets. So let's say that Elon Musk dies. His kids, his wife, his family, the people he leave behind, are they going to suffer financially? Now they do depend on him, right? He's he was producing the income, he has the wealth, his children are depending on him for that. But are they really in trouble? Really? No, right? They're not. Because he has existing assets. He's what we call self-insured okay so he doesn't need life insurance to pay his family in case he dies there's already plenty of money to give them any lifestyle they could possibly want and so as you accumulate money and wealth in your retirement account you do reach a point where you've saved up enough that your family could continue with what you've saved even if life insurance didn't pay and at that point you'd be self-insured too you don't have to be a billionaire to be self-insured, Elon Musk is just an obvious example. It's obvious that his kids will be okay. Well, you'll reach a point too where your kids will be all right too based on the amount of assets you've accumulated to that point. And if you reach that point, then technically you no longer need life insurance to pay your survivors. Life insurance is the final way to meet this need as it's the topic we're gonna to talk about the most, but it covers the gap between your existing assets and how much your family needs. So how much do you need? There's a couple of ways to figure it out. The first approach is called a multiple of earnings approach, where you just take how much you earn, your salary, and times it by a number. I've heard people say times it by 8. I've heard people say times it by 15. I've heard people say times it by 11, times it by 20. Nobody can quite agree on what the right number is. And that's because there isn't one number that's right for anyone. It depends on how much you make, how old you are, how many kids you have, how many debts you have. Like, and so just picking a number and saying, I'm going to buy 10 times my salary. I mean, it's easy to do, easy to get a number, but it's really very questionable how accurate it is. Now, if you're looking at buying some life insurance and you're working with a life insurance agent and they say, yeah, I think you need X number of dollars of insurance. I think you need $700,000 of life insurance, say. Ask them how they got that number. And if they either can't or won't explain it, or they just say, oh, it's 10 times your salary, it's 12 times your salary, that's usually good. 
if they say one of those things, they don't, they won't explain, or they just multiply two numbers, then you should fire that agent because they're not doing anything for you that you couldn't do for yourself. You can multiply two numbers together, right? So they're really not helping you out. And why pay for advice when that advice is not helpful? Now, the other approach, and if you're going to pay someone to help you with life insurance, they should do this. It's called the needs based approach. So what this is, you sit down and you say, OK, I have uh, 25 years working left. What's the present value of 25 years worth of earnings? I have this much on my mortgage. I want my kids to be able to go to college. How much will college cost by the time they're ready to go? Let's save enough to provide for that. That's complicated. You need to do a lot of time value money calculations. OK, I'm not going to make you do it in this class. It's very complicated, lots and lots of steps. And, and it's just far beyond what you need to do. If you're going to work with a life insurance professional to figure out how much you need, though, they should do this for you. And if they don't, then they're probably not doing enough to be worth paying them for. Now, what type of life insurance should you buy? There's a handful of different types of life insurances, but we're going to break them into two basic categories. Okay, first is term insurance. Term insurance works like this. You pick a term, say 15 years or 20 years or 30 years. The term is the period of time. If you die in that period of time, the insurance policy pays you the death benefit. And that's it. Pretty simple, just pure protection. If the bad things happen, if the bad thing happens, your family gets paid. Straight, straightforward, simple, and easy. But it does expire. At the end of the term, it goes away. There's no more insurance. That's term. The other type, the other category is called cash value insurance. Where you get that protection if you die it pays but you also get to invest you get to put some assets in it and it can grow and the advantage here is that they get tax deferred status just like a, uh, actually tax free status like a roth ira so that's great like if you want to save money for retirement you don't want to pay taxes you can do that in cash value insurance policies plus they have lots of really cool features that you can use if you have complicated set of needs. Like let's say you have three or four marriages, children from different spouses, you need someone to take over. You can use life cash value life insurance to sell and buy businesses. Okay, there's lots of like really complicated, cool things you can do with cash value insurance. The problem is it tends to be very expensive and it's not something that most people really need. But term insurance gets a pretty bad rap. People like cash value insurance. They like that it's permanent. It doesn't expire at the end of the term. And they like that. They're thinking, if I'm going to buy life insurance, I may as well buy life insurance that's guaranteed to pay me, right? Well, no. Again, that makes sense, right? You, you can understand why people like that sentiment. Like, yeah, if I'm going to buy life insurance, I should buy one that's going to pay. Like, why pay for something that's not going to pay? But remember what we talked about in our intro principles of risk management. You don't get insurance to make money off it, right? What you're getting from the insurance is a good night's sleep reassurance that if the worst happens, your family's taken care of. That's what you're buying. And term insurance is the most efficient way to do that. It's much cheaper and much more and just as effective in many cases. Now, Term insurance gets a bad rap. And people like these cash value policies. They like whole life. They like universal life. They like these types of cash value policies. And so you'll see memes like this. Remember, term insurance equals terminating insurance. Good luck doesn't last forever, but good insurance does, implying that term insurance is bad because term insurance doesn't last forever. Or you see something like this, the cute little kitty. Oh, life insurance can build wealth and protect my family. Yes, it can. But is that the best way to accomplish those purposes? Just because it can do it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. So let's explore an alternative. Let's see why this maybe is not the best way to go. Okay, so here we have a chart. We have money on the vertical axis, age on the horizontal. This green curve is how much life insurance you need. As you age, generally speaking, your need for life insurance declines, right? your kids are growing up they become independent they no longer depend on your paycheck right when you're 80 years old 
I hope your kids can take care of themselves by then, right? Because they should be like 50, maybe even older, right? They should be able to take care of themselves, but they're no longer dependent on your paycheck. Plus, when you're 80, how much paycheck do you have? Most people don't have any paycheck at all. So they have no need for life insurance because nobody's going to suffer financially when they die. But they get mixed up, right? We get confused. We think, but when I'm 80 or 85, <clears throat> yeah, maybe no one will suffer financially, but that's when I'm most likely to die. I want my policy to pay me. So I'm going to buy the, the cash value policy because it's guaranteed to pay me. <clears throat> Remember, how much life insurance you need, whether or not you need it at all, it has nothing to do with how likely you are to die and everything to do with what happens to your survivors if you die. If someone who's 85 years old, their survivors are going to be just fine. They can take care of themselves by now. And even if they couldn't, when you're 85, you don't have a paycheck to lose, right? You're not working, so you don't have a paycheck to lose. So you really don't need life insurance very much at that age. At least most people don't. There can be some exceptions, right? Which is why I'm telling you the concept. The concept is, will someone suffer financially if I die? So when you're 85, you can ask yourself that question and decide for yourself if that's going to happen, if there's a need. <clears throat> The problem with this is that as you age, the cost of the insurance rises exponentially. It gets more and more and more and more expensive. The cost of the insurance does depend on how likely you are to die. So when you're 85, you have no need for insurance, but it's extremely expensive. And so you're paying a lot for something you don't really actually need. Now, the life insurance salesman, they'll tell you, well, you're not actually paying for it. The insurance becomes free. Because usually these policies have a fixed premium. The dollar amount that you pay each year or each month stays the same for the whole policy. And they'll tell you, and they're not wrong, that, hey, when you reach a certain point, you can just stop paying for the insurance. It becomes free at that point. That's what they'll tell you. While it's true that you can stop paying for the insurance, that does not mean it's free. Okay, so if you're using a cash value policy, you have a balance in there, just like you have a balance in your IRA or a balance in your checking account. You have a balance in your life insurance policy. As you contribute, as you make payments of premium, that cash value will go up. However, if you stop making payments or the cost of the insurance becomes higher than the amount that you're paying because that cost is increasing. Just because they're not charging you more doesn't mean the cost hasn't gone up. So when that cost becomes larger than what you're paying, either because you've stopped paying or because it's just you've gotten older and the cost has gone up, at that point, they will start paying for the policy out of your cash value and they'll deduct it automatically. They don't tell you that they're doing that. They don't send you a statement. And so what happens is, you know, your grandma is 85 years old and she's got her policy and she's like, it's free, it's free. Yay, I have my free insurance. Well, she doesn't realize that all that money she saved in her life insurance policy is getting eaten up at an incredibly fast rate by paying for the cost of the insurance that she doesn't need. Research has found that about 70% of all the money saved in life insurance policies, 70% of it gets taken by the insurance company. So if you've saved a million dollars in your cash value life insurance policy, let's say you've saved up a million dollars in there, that's great. On average, the insurance company will take 700,000 of that to pay the cost of the insurance after you stop making your premiums. So this is why this may be not the best way to do this. It sounds great. You die, it pays out, everyone's happy, right? Mm, maybe the happiest person in this scenario is the life insurance company. Another thing to be wary of, anytime you talk to someone who sells life insurance, 
I promise you, they're going to push whole life, variable life, universal life, all of these cash value policies. Those are all different types of cash value policies. They're going to push those. They don't push term insurance policies. They don't. And it makes sense why. So I worked one summer selling life insurance. They told me I would be a financial advisor. I was not a financial advisor. I was selling life insurance. I did that job for one month before I realized the racket and quit. If I sold a term insurance policy, like a $300,000 death benefit term insurance policy, I earned about $30 in commission. If I sold a $300,000 cash value policy, I earned between $300 and $400, excuse me, $350 to $400 in commission. So now I'm the sales rep. I have a family to feed. I got to make, I got rent to pay, I got groceries to buy, got a car to fix, right? I have my own needs. Which one am I going to push? Which one am I going to feel pressure to push? It's not the term, right? You got to sell an awful lot of term policies at 30 bucks a pop to make a living wage. But these cash value policies, you don't have to, you can do 10 times less, right? Now, most of these life insurance agents think they're doing a good job. I'm not trying to accuse them of being unethical. On the contrary, most of them think legitimately that the policy they're pushing is the best policy for you. The problem is not their intent and not their desires for most of them. Some of them are just jerks and are trying to rip you off. But most of them I genuinely believe are honest people trying to do good. Trouble is most of them have no education or background in insurance or financial planning. The only training they get on life insurance comes from, you wanna guess? The insurance company. And of course the insurance company tells them that the products that make them the most money are also the ones that are best for the customer. And that is not always the case. In fact, most of the time, it's not the case. So remember, we, we've talked previously in the semester, as a rule of thumb, if a company is pushing something, the thing they're pushing hardest, is it because it makes them very little money? Mm -mm. No, right? They're pushing it hard because it makes them a lot of money. So be wary of it. If they're really pushing a particular product, step back. Be careful. It may be the best product for you. I'm not saying it isn't. But you need to be careful because it's almost certain that it's the product that makes them the most money. Not necessarily the one that's best for you. So these life insurance agents think they're doing a good job because they don't know better. And they haven't realized that there's a problem with the insurance company being their source of education on this material. <clears throat> now, let's see what the alternative is. So this is an example of a variable universal life policy. It's a type of cash value insurance policy that mimics a mutual fund. It earns actually stock market returns and it can lose money just like stock market. First thing I want you to notice about this product is how long this document is. It's 136 pages long. This is a complicated instrument. No way around it, 136 pages. You're not gonna read all 136 pages of this. I'm not gonna read all 136 pages of this and financial planning's my life. And I don't wanna read all of this, that's a ton. That's crazy, right? So it's complicated. Now complicated does not mean bad, but it is complicated. It's not a term policy, it's a type of cash value. If it was term, it would say some type of 15 year term, 10 year term, 30 year term. It would say term in the title and how many years. So since it doesn't say that, it's a cash value. Now let's look at this. I'm gonna to skip to Appendix B, illustration of cash value. So here's how they sell these things. What they'll do is the sales rep will sit down and say, look, if you're a 35 year old man in good health, we can get you $350,000 of 
life insurance and it will only cost you $250 a year. And look, after 30 years, you're going to have $250,000 in this account. If you buy a term insurance policy, you'll have zero. But if you buy this policy, you'll have $251,000. After 40 years, you'll have $600,000. Well, that's a no-brainer, right? Zero is worse than $630,000. So you're like, hey, look, I get the protection I need. It doesn't expire. And I get $600,000. Sign me up, right? It makes total sense to buy this product when you look just at these numbers. Let's explore this care more carefully though. So I've pulled up here. This is a quote for a 35 year old man, average height, average weight, good health, non-smoker. That's this preferred non-smoker, the risk class for a $350,000 term insurance policy. It will cost $30 a month. So let's do $30.45 a month times 12 is $365 a year. That's the insurance premium. So the term policy will cost you $365 a year. This cash value policy will cost you $2,500 a year. So let's say you have $2,500 a year and you're trying to decide, should I buy cash value policy or should I buy term? In order to get an apples to apples comparison, you're going to spend $2,500 a year regardless. You can either buy the cash value policy for $2,500 a year, or you can buy the term for $365 a year. And then the difference, the $2,135, you can invest. Put that in an IRA. So in both scenarios, you're going to spend $2,500 a year. You can spend $2,500 on the cash value or $365 on term and invest $2,135. But you're going to spend the same amount of money in both scenarios. So let's see what that looks like. So we're going to do $2,135 here. And let's do... Let's do 30 years, age 35 to age 65. And you earn, if we look here, in their scenario, they earn 10%. So let's use 10% in our calculator too. Calculate, and what do we got? So in 30 years, your IRA will have $386,000 in it. 386,000. The cash value policy after 30 years had how much? 251. That's a lot less. That's $130,000 less. What if we stretch it to 40 years? Oh, it won't let me do it. We'll do it this way. We'll just make you start younger doesn't really matter. The, the point is we need 40 years from start to finish. If you do 40 years, you have $1 million in your IRA. $1 million. In their illustration, they had 630. Where did your $400,000 go? Where did it go? I'll show you. Okay, so here's four pages worth of fees. Four pages to describe the fees in this policy. Two pages to describe your premium, the cost of the insurance. And then, oh yeah, we're not done yet. Here's another five pages to describe charges, not fees, charges. These are somehow supposed to be different. So you have like 12 pages here to describe the different fees and charges. 
Now, I don't know how much all these will be, but if you pay these fees, it'll cost you $400,000 over 40 years, right? Because you had a million here, and now you have 600,000 here. So if you buy the, the cash value policy, it will cost you $400,000 over 40 years at a 10% interest rate relative to buying a term policy that gives you the same protection when you need it most for less and you invest the difference by term and invest the difference. So what does that $400,000 buy you? It buys you this. So this is for a 30 year policy. So after 30 years, this is going to expire. So our 35 year old hypothetical person here is not going to have life insurance after 65. There's going to be no more insurance. If they die after 65, their family gets no payout. This one, the family will get a payout. They will at age 40 or, you know, after 30 years. So you have to decide, is that $400,000, is that worth these extra years of coverage? That's what you need to ask yourself. May be worth it to you, may not be. But if we extend it even further, let's say, let's do 50 years. Two point seven million in the IRA and fifty years here is one point five. Now you're at one point two million dollar gap. One point two million dollars less. Now at fifty years you're getting an extra twenty years of coverage. So if you buy this policy, let's say when you're twenty five, right, your coverage would end when you were fifty five. And so you're paying $1.2 million to get an to make sure your family gets paid $350,000 if you die between the ages of 55 and 75. Is it worth paying $1.2 million to give your family $350,000 on the chance that you die between 55 and 75? That's the question you need to ask yourself. I don't think that's worth it. I'd rather just have the cash on hand. I'd rather, because then, what if I want to give it to my kids before I die? What if I want to help my grandkids with college? And I don't have any money left because all my money is in this retirement account, this in life insurance. I can't cash out this death benefit. I can't cash it out unless I die. But if I just have it, in my IRA, I can cash that out and give it to them for college or to help them buy their first house or whatever. So that's why the general advice is for most people, you should buy term insurance and invest the difference. Now, I spent all this time kind of bashing on cash value life insurance, but cash value life insurance is actually incredible. Okay. For high net worth people, if you have lots of money or a complicated situation, you can use life insurance to give you tax-free investments. See, most people don't need life insurance policies to give them tax-free investments, right? We talked about unit three. Between 401ks and IRAs, very few families are going to need to save enough money to hit their caps on the 401k annual contribution and the IRA contribution limit. But if you make lots of money, if you make $350,000 a year, you probably do need more places to get tax deferred growth. And so when you have that kind of income and you're in a very high tax bracket, it becomes beneficial to use the life insurance and pay the fees in the life insurance because the fees in the life insurance will be cheaper than the taxes on your investments, but only if you're in one of those high income tax brackets. And they only get there by having an extremely high income. Okay, it's great for managing estate taxes. As of 2020, the only the only households that will need to worry about estate taxes are households where you have a married couple and they own more than 22 million dollars in assets. If that's you, 
then life insurance starts to become valuable. But again, how many people are going to have $22 million when they die? Not many. So if that's you, then get some life insurance. But don't just buy life insurance, right? If you have that much money, hire a professional, and they may recommend life insurance to give you tax-free investment growth, to pay your estate taxes, and that's great. That's an incredibly good use of this life insurance. Balancing inheritances, it can be useful for that. If you have multiple marriages, it could be helpful there. If you have a special needs child, someone with Down syndrome or who can't function as adults by themselves, you want to leave money to take care of them, it can be helpful for that. Or if you want to, like, say, donate a bunch of money to your alma mater and they're going to name the new college of business building after you, okay, this can be a great way to do that as well. Okay, you can do a lot of things with trusts, often for less money and greater flexibility, but you will need a lawyer to set up the trust. So what's the bottom line for life insurance then? First, the more dependents you have, the more life insurance you need. But the more assets you have, the less life insurance you're going to need. Do you need life insurance? If you do, then buy term insurance unless you have lots of money or a particularly complicated situation like the special needs or multiple marriages like I talked about for the cash value policies. If you have one of those complicated situations, then hire a professional to help you do that right. But other than that, most people should just buy term life insurance and invest the difference because they'll come out a lot better and save a lot of money.